Good morning and welcome to the 2013 Columbia Business School Social Enterprise Conference. I want to begin by thanking all of you for joining us this morning, a fairly early hour to get started, and for what I expect will be a really fantastic day of discussion. I also want to begin by thanking several key people, in particular Jenny Tolan and Vanula Menon, who are our co-chairmen, conference co-chairs, uh, who have done a terrific job with their team in bringing this event together. I also wish to thank our today's sponsors, our financial sponsors, our gold sponsors, are HP and Wells Fargo, and our silver sponsors, BNP Paribas, Intel, Goldman Sachs, Mitchell Gold, and Bob Williams. It's through the efforts of our student leaders and our financial sponsors that we're here today to execute on Columbia Business School's social enterprise program's mission, which is to train the next generation of leaders to address the world's environmental and social problems. In fulfilling this mission, Today's conference is a hallmark of our program's goal to create a space for the creation and exchange of new ideas. I'm gonna hand, uh, hand the mic over to my colleague in the program, Professor Ray Fisman, to introduce our first session. Uh, thanks, Bruce. I'd like to start by echoing your welcome. Um, I'd also like to start by saying, as I suspect I do every single year, um, that's been a really exciting time to be involved in the social enterprise program and the social enterprise movement more broadly, uh, which has seen enormous growth in recent days. Uh, it's been very exciting to be a witness to this and a sometimes participant in it. Now, if I can make a sort of obvious observation, um, it's going to be pretty hard to change the world if the people in this room have to pull the, bring the other 6.99 billion inhabitants of the planet kicking and screaming along with us as we try to change the world. That is, uh, if I can torture a much overused metaphor, you know, not only can you not force the horse to drink, the horse has to be pretty enthusiastic about coming along with you in the first place, right? So we need to involve a larger set of people uh, in our objectives. And the th this is exactly the theme of today's discussion. That is, how can we take our own ideas and passions and involve a much broader set of people and, in fact, energize them to become involved themselves? Now, the irony would be a bit too much if, given the theme today of actively involving others, we then sent you forth to the various rooms where we'll have the smaller sessions and told you to sit passively and listen. So most of the workshops and discussions today will be quite interactive and we'll work together to think about um, how to come up with better ways of addressing the many problems um, that our own passions uh, have brought us to. Now, I am personally thrilled to have the chance to get this conversation started this morning with two eminent social entrepreneurs. Uh, I've had the enormous privilege to have had conversations and occasional email exchanges with one of the uh, two opening speakers, and I always leave these conversations, and in fact, even these email exchanges, both entertained and edified. Uh, I become a wiser and better person by virtue of them, uh, which is exactly the sort of person you will, um, uh, can look forward to sitting and listening to. Uh, so I'd like to uh, turn things over at this point to Rachel Sklar, the uh, founder of Change the Ratio and The List, uh, two programs that are aimed at empowering women, uh, to introduce Jeremy of Purpose and uh, Charles of DonorsChoose.org to get the conversation started this morning. Rachel. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to uh, continue with that metaphor about leading horses to water uh, in my introduction of Jeremy and Charles because uh, they have figured out not only how to lead that horse to water, uh, they have figured out how to make that horse click, respond to emails, donate money, and then turn around and carry that water for them. And that is how you build a 21st century movement. So uh, without further ado, um, I will introduce Jeremy Hymans, the co-founder and CEO of Purpose. And if you are tweeting, oh, his 
Twitter handle is there. And mine is Rachel Sklar, just so that it's spelled in the program that you all have in front of you. So uh, Jeremy is the co-founder and CEO of Purpose, and he has been <laughs> shaking things up since he was eight years old in his native Australia. Uh, since the launch of Purpose in 2009, it's launched several major new organizations, including All Out, a 1.5 million strong LGBT rights group, built the world's first open source global activism platform, and advised institutions like Bill uh, and Melinda Gates Foundation, the ACLU, and Google. And today he will be advising you on how to take your big idea and change the world. Uh, as a child activist in Australia, Mr. Hyman's ran media campaigns, lobbied leaders on issues like children's rights and nuclear non-proliferation. Uh, in 2004, he dropped out of Oxford to co-found a campaign group in the US presidential elections that used crowdfunding to help women whose loved ones were in Iraq hire a private jet to follow Vice President Dick Cheney on his campaign stops in what became known as the Chasing Cheney Tour. A lot of excitement and a lot of annoying people in power along the way. The following year, he co-founded Get Up, an Australian political organization and internationally recognized social movement phenomenon that today has more members than all of Australia's political parties combined. In 2007, he, Jeremy co-founded Avaz, the world's largest online citizens movement, now with more than 20 million members, and I'm pretty sure you've probably all clicked on one of their emails. I know I have. In 2011, he received the Ford Foundation's 75th Anniversary Visionary Award for his work as a movement pioneer and the World Economic Forum named him a young global leader. He is on many, many lists, including Fast Company's 100 Most Creative People in 2012. And uh, today, he is going to teach you how to build a movement in, I'm sure, five easy steps. So without further ado, the co-founder and CEO of Purpose, Jeremy Hymans. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Well, uh, thanks very much for coming. And uh, those of you who've chosen to, to be here in New York at 8 a.m. Uh, on a Friday have chosen to do so because you're at this intersection. You're at this new intersection of uh, old power and new power. Social enterprise and the broader social enterprise movement is in this fuzzy, ambiguous, exciting new space where we're trying to define new models. And I think that what I want to talk to you to do about today is how these new models are taking shape and why they matter. It's not a coincidence that all around the world, uh, models that aggregate the power of people that are enabled by peer-to-peer -peer involvement by participation are transforming all of the sectors in which they operate. Charles is going to talk about the ways in which donors choose is transforming the way education is funded. You know, in Italy, uh, a couple months ago, a blogger with no political connections, no political apparatus uh, or organization almost won the largest share of the vote in the Italian national elections, which isn't just because Italy is already a circus. Um, you know, uh, Kickstarter, as we know, this little startup that's been going for three, four years, just eclipsed the National Endowment of the Arts as the largest funder of arts in the United States. Extraordinary, right? Airbnb, a six-year-old startup, uh, just eclipsed all of the major hotel groups as the largest provider of accommodation in the world. Now, none of these things are unrelated. They're all part of a broader shift because these models are all new power models enabled by participation, enabled by people's power to self-organize and aggregate. And I want to talk to you about what's new and what's the same about this world in which we operate. Uh, as Rachel mentioned, I was a strange and intense child. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to give you a little story to illustrate how life has changed from when I was an activist compared to when, uh, compared to, to today. So this is me when, uh, when I was a kid. Today we spoke to Jeremy Hyman's at his Sydney home. Well, I think we have got problems, and I think we have got monetary problems. Uh, what you could do is divert 10% of each nation's annual military spending to services of debt, the environment, and, you know, health, malnutrition, children, and all these problems because we spend an excessive amount, an enormous amount on the military, which is completely uh, unnecessary to spend so much, and instead we've got to spend that money on immediate problems, problems that uh, endanger our uh, entire society. So, uh, <laughs> at least I wasn't arguing for more military spending. Um, so, uh, so that was me, you know, and my tool was the facts. 
that was my organizing tool. You know, during the, uh, the lead up to the first Gulf War, I organized an international fax campaign where we flooded the hotel that James Baker and Tariq Aziz were staying in, inundating them, not very effectively or efficiently, with faxes in order to apply pressure. You know, uh, strangely enough, it was hard to scale that kind of campaign. Um, the pipes are only so big, right? So this is Bia, who's 11 years old. And this is what Bia from Rio uh, can achieve today. So Bia um, uh, went to a school that was about to be summarily uh, bulldozed by uh, the city government in Rio to make way for an Olympic changing facility. All of these places all over Rio are being bulldozed and evicted to make way for this huge flood of Olympic development. And it's not being done in a way that's participatory or accountable. So Bia created this campaign using a platform that we created called Pressure Cooker in Rio that allowed her to start a campaign uh, against the closure of her school and sort of create grassroots energy around that. What we did was My Rio, one of the organizations that Purpose has incubated, um, decided to turn this into an iconic campaign around uh, what's happening to these venerable places in Rio. So what we did was we created a website and we fixed a live webcam on the school. And we said to people, we know that the demolition is gonna happen at some point in the next week. Sign up, leave your mobile phone, and agree to become a text guardian of the school. As soon as people who are observing the site see evidence of bulldozers, we will rush to the school, you'll get a text message, and form a human barrier to protect the school. And this is the sort of thing you can only do today. Uh, now, uh, it turns out that just by articulating that, and articulating uh, this, through this through this site, the mayor of Rio said, you know what, maybe I won't close the school, and actually agreed to a participatory process um, for future school closures. So, you know, we won, and this is a very small example, but, you know, on a much bigger scale, this is happening all over the world. This is a not-so-young person. His name is Ana Hazare. He's an Indian Gandhian anti-corruption activist. He's anyone but a digital activist, or at least the person you would expect to be. It turns out, though, that Hazare was experimenting with new forms of digital engagement. And he asked people to do something called a missed call. Who here knows what a missed call is? Right. So some people who are not from, um, from rich countries know that all over the developing world, in mobile phone culture, people leave each other missed calls as a way to avoid phone charges, but to communicate something. So if I'm running late for an appointment, I'll leave you a missed call. If I'm dating you and I miss you, I might leave you a missed call. And there's a whole language around this. It's called phishing, beeping, uh, flashing in different countries. So Hazare says, if you support my national campaign against everyday corruption in India, leave me a missed call. Anyone want to guess how many missed calls Hazare got? 35 million. 35 million people in India uh, left a missed call, which created the basis for not only the world's longest CSV file, that's a, that's a geeky joke, um, but also the beginnings of a movement. He was able to turn out hundreds of thousands of people on the streets in Delhi uh, and elsewhere uh, in order to accelerate his campaign by using this enormous base of people that he then had the contact details of, re-engage them, take them from online or from the mobile sphere to offline. So we built a tool called CrowdRing to enable that to happen anywhere, so that anyone, anywhere, can create one of these missed calls campaigns. So we're, we're seeing this bigger structural shift, which is that people are really sensing their own agency. This isn't about mobile phones or faxes um, or computers. It's actually about the ways in which these mechanisms are changing people, right? If you fund something on Kickstarter, you get a little sense that you're powerful, that you made that happen, that you enabled something. If you, you know, joined the We Are All Khaled Sayed Facebook page in the lead up to the Tahrir Square uh, were, re revolution, you got a sense that you were not alone. And so we have this shift, and you guys are all part of it, which is that people now expect to participate. And these new models that are emerging are actually changing people's sense of their own agency. So we tried this at the global level um, to address this problem. This is the sort of asymmetry of power at the global level where you know, governments and corporations are very organized transnationally, but ordinary people aren't. So we decided to launch an organization called Avaz, which is a, essentially a global platform 
to aggregate citizen power and to kind of rebalance power between those technocratic elites sitting there deciding on global financial regulations or the fate of the, of the, of the, of the planet's climate uh, and the preferences of ordinary people, which were not easily organized before. And Avaz now has, it changes every, every few weeks, but uh, 26, 27 million members uh, in every country on Earth. So that's the backdrop for Purpose. And Purpose is a social enterprise, and proudly so, a B Corp, which is essentially a home for these kinds of experiments, for the development, incubation of new movements, and to help existing organizations apply movement thinking to their own work. So we bring together this crazy group of people that you wouldn't think you would necessarily bring together for this kind of work. We bring together uh, political organizers, behavioral economists, technologists, people who are fabulous at storytelling and who understand the art of branding and brand strategy, uh, you know, visual and interaction designers, and even the people that we call the McKinsey refugees. Um, some of you guys will be that soon, I promise. I am too. So movement entrepreneurs, um, and the model that we use is basically based on the idea of how do you apply the principles of effective lean entrepreneurship to the process of starting social movements. Because it's really hard for big lumbering NGOs to effectively organize people, because to organize people you need to take risks, you need to be creative, you need to be tactically innovative. So we've developed this model called movement entrepreneurships, which is how we launch our own movements at Purpose, and we've launched many. So movement entrepreneurs we call are digitally savvy outsiders who create new sources of power by aggregating and mobilizing the voices of many. These are a few of the movement entrepreneurs that we have spawned at Purpose. And I should warn you, they're all very good looking. This is, uh, this is Alessandra. She launched My Rio, the anti-corruption and civic participation movement in Rio that I, I mentioned to you earlier. This is Andre, who launched All Out, which is our global gay rights group, and in just a couple of years has grown to have more grassroots members than any gay rights group in the world, and is very involved right now, for example, in the fight against Russia and its anti-gay laws in the lead up to the Olympics. And this is Al Noor, who founded The Rules, which is a really interesting new attempt to use missed calls and other mobile phone organizing techniques to organize large swathes of the world's poor to directly advocate around the structural injustices that exist in the global system. So what does all this mean for you? What are some lessons that could be applied to your work out in the world as social entrepreneurs, as business people, um, if you want to start thinking like a movement builder, if you want to start thinking like the people who are developing these new peer-driven participatory models which have this enormous capacity to scale? So firstly, I'd urge you all to think like a movement builder, not a marketer. I know that those of you who are Columbia MBAs are probably being taught marketing. And I think the mindset of marketing is not a good mindset for the 21st century, because it's kind of generally about, you know, kind of talking at people. So uh, think in terms of long-term movement building, not marketing campaigns. Think in terms of how to aggregate large numbers to create that big funnel in, and then to systematically move people up this curve of engagement. Think of actions as your metric, not just conversations or eyeballs, uh, and really give ownership of, um, of the movement to people. So creating a movement is about the, the construction of a long-term community, a holding environment for people's energy that you grow and cultivate over time, not uh, you know, a series of pulses and short-term marketing pushes. Secondly, um, if you want to build a movement in the 21st century, it's not about you. It's not about these guys. These are our friends from the 20th century, some of them uh, some of them friends, some of them, some of them not so much. But what, what unites all of these people is they're all charismatic leaders. And in the 20th century, when you didn't have this ability for a few people in a garage to build a multi-million person movement, um, you needed these bully pulpits, these large institutional roles in order to be able to bring people with you. Um, what we see today is movements that are heavily reliant on charismatic leaders unravel. So if you're Lance Armstrong and something you know, goes wrong with your reputation, what happens? Even if you're Barack Obama and people lose faith in you or you know, are projecting too much on you and expect too much of you, that disillusionment will lead to a lot less engagement. So the most effective movements today, they're not leaderless, they're actually leaderful. They really uh, engage people um, at all levels of the movement um, to exercise real leadership. And they're not without strategy and direction. 
it doesn't mean that you want to abandon top-down focus, because people do need direction, but they don't anchor on these kind of heroic uh, or villainous figures. Um, we need to move from, and I think this is what's happening right now, um, a, a posture of sound bites, which is very much how people communicated in the 20th century, to um, a mean drops approach. What do I mean by a mean drop? So basically, in the 20th century, if you wanted to get a message out there, you developed this perfect sound bite, and the job was to repeat it as many times as possible. Why? Because there were only a few nodes of mainstream media through which you got your message out. So you actually had the ability to be pretty disciplined. Today, the best thing you can do is actually um, deliberately construct your messaging in a way that people can take it, adapt it, change it, remix it, and adopt it as their own. And that actually requires you to be fundamentally different in the way that you message it. It means that you, you know, adopt more of an Occupy mindset, where Occupy develops this really interesting set of imagery and language, 99% Occupy, and they sort of say to people, no one owns this, no institution has branded this, go take it and occupy everything. And then you saw this explosion of creativity around the appropriation of those memes. Now, you know, what you then need is to follow that up with actual consolidation and organization, which didn't happen in the case of Occupy, but you see the power of this kind of approach to communications. That said, it's not enough just to, just to uh, have memes, although I might add that at purpose in the office, anytime anyone comes up with a good idea for a meme, I play the dancing cat that I, that I bought um, on the streets of Rome recently, very peculiar. It sings Shania Twain. Um, but ultimately, memes aren't enough. You actually have to build long-term power, long-term community. Uh, you also have to do storytelling in a way that is new and authentic. This is an example of a, a, a storytelling approach that I think um, is highly effective in this new era. So that very powerful video was made by um, our director of content, and you know it was the most popular video in the world on YouTube for a week, and you know really, really moved people. Um, and it always leaves leaves groups like this silent because it, it really does grab you because of its universality. What's important about this is that you don't just build the internet meme and get gazillions of YouTube views and declare victory, because what social change end does that really serve? So ultimately, what you have to do is embed that kind of thing within movements where the energy that this kind of thing creates can be turned to action. So in that case, it was part of an effort to make gay marriage part of the governing party's uh, per platform in Australia. So what we did is we ran this uh, ad in the lead up to the vote um, uh, on this platform. We drenched the airwaves with, with this, absolutely surrounded it in the lead up. Um, people donated gazillions of dollars to actually put it on the air, uh, and we were able to narrowly win that vote. 
So think about how you can tell stories, and then think about how those stories can be part of movements. So the kind of method behind this is really quite simple. In the 20th century, you might have uh, tried to get people to join your club. People used to join movements and organizations, and they would get a card in the mail. Uh, they would pay dues every month, and, and that's how they would participate. That model's sort of dying now, right? And part of what we do at Purpose is we help existing organizations like the ACLU sort of shift their model from that model to the new model. People affiliate more loosely, but you can get much larger, the pe uh, larger numbers of people involved more efficiently. So you make the barrier to entry very low, you make it very easy to join, and then you apply a methodology to systematically move people up that commitment curve and get them to take ever uh, more committed actions that are you know, inherently more difficult. Um, so you know, the other thing that I'd say to corporates, for those of you who are in the room, is when you're thinking about this new methodology, um, if you're not quite there yet, avoid declaring victory. Because in this new era, um, spin, the kind of top-down soundbite methodology, will eventually meet its match. This is a great example of a campaign where Chevron ran this We Agree campaign. They spent a ton of money uh, trying to kind of white greenwash their environmental record. And uh, this fantastic group of political satirists here, based here in New York, the Yes Men, created a remixable version of these ads where you could go and create your own ads sending up this. They set, set a website up that made it look like it was from Chevron, and it got far more traffic than the Chevron ads. Uh, and so, you know, in this current era, you have to think quite differently about the way in which you communicate. And so I'm going to sort of skip through these because we're running out of time, but a couple of things to leave you with. You know, one is um, when you think about the models that you set up for the social enterprises that you run, I like to say fund it well, then fund it by the people. You can't always jump immediately to a crowdfunding model or to a kind of uh, peer-based model. So it is smart to go and raise institutional funds or venture funds or whatever it is that you need to do first so that you can run your social enterprise in a highly professional, highly structured way. But then make sure that you've built into that model from the beginning this ability to scale using um, people power. And so the trajectory for many of the organizations that we have started is that we get some institutional funding uh, and then within three or four years we make that transition to being fully funded by the crowd. So I'm going to leave it there, um, but uh, I think that the broader question is you guys are all in this position to go out and create new power. Uh, and if you're going to work for established organizations to try to embed this new power thinking and values into the work that you do. Uh, and so I'm very excited about what you guys are all going to do and look forward to the questions later. Thanks so much. So now that you're all inspired, I want to actually call back to uh, a little point on Jeremy's last slide, which was micro donations. And that is a good segue into talking about Charles Best, who is the founder of DonorsChoose.org, and if I may for a moment uh, talk about myself, uh, it's really one of my absolute favorite things on the internet ever, ever, ever. Uh, every year on my birthday, I do a campaign where I donate my birthday to Donors Choose, and I can't even begin to tell you how much fun it is to see all of my friends sending their micro donations to fund one of the many classroom projects that Donors Choose enables to be funded uh, through its amazing, amazing platform. Uh, at Donors Choose, public school teachers create classroom projects requests, and donors can choose through the different projects and pick, pick the projects that they want to support. And it's basically the greatest thing in the world. It's, it's, you get all of the rush that you get from shopping and none of the guilt. Uh, Charles launched uh, Donors Choose in 2000 out of a Bronx public high school where he taught history. And fast forward to today, it is one of Oprah Winf Winfrey's ultimate favorite things, so me and Oprah, Oprah have something in common. Uh, was named by Fast Company as one of the 50 most innovative companies in the world. And Stephen Colbert is a <laughs> huge fan, as you will see shortly. Uh, for three years, Fortune magazine has named Charles its 40 under 40 hottest rising stars in business. And he is a fantastic entrepreneur and a fantastic leader. And I am going to fast forward to his presentation now. Let's see if this works. That was what I was supposed to do when I got up here. And now, 
There are few times in history when the saying, we're all in this together, would be more applicable than right now. Charles Best, he came up with a revolutionary idea during lunch in the teacher's lounge. My colleagues and I were talking about books that we wanted our students to read, field trips we wanted to take them on, art supplies that we needed, but these ideas wouldn't go beyond the teacher's lunchroom. And then I just figured that there were people from all walks of life who wanted to help improve our public schools. Through Donors Choose, ordinary citizens can directly fund projects initiated by enterprising public school teachers. Teachers request dictionaries, science kits, field trips, resources that their students need to thrive. Then you can give to the project request that most inspires you with a donation of any amount. It's such a simple, wonderful idea. You know exactly who you're helping and how you're helping them. I love to give and know that I, I have a connection. It's a, a very easy way to give back to public schools. This is exactly the kind of social innovation we should be encouraging across this country. I love DonorsChoose.org, and it's why I'm on the board and why I'm committed to helping it in any way I can. Make sure you check it out, DonorsChoose.org. Let's not underestimate the power each of us has to change the world for someone. Hey guys, um, this is an awesome, awesome uh, crowd. Thank you again, I wanna echo Jeremy's gratitude for you guys showing up so early. I wanna, um, I wanna tell you a story about how DonorsChoose.org grew out of my classroom in the Bronx, and as part of that, I'm gonna uh, tell you the most embarrassing and awful thing I've ever done. Uh, and then I'm gonna give you a few examples of how we are engaging customers and clients in social change. Now let me start by asking you a question. How many of you had a teacher in high school who changed your life? Raise your hand. All right, most of you, that's awesome. Um, I also had a teacher like that. His name was Mr. Buxton. He was my English teacher and my wrestling coach. And when I showed up as a dorky freshman in high school, I was not the, the playboy that Jeremy was when he was uh, 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 a freshman. When I showed up uh, as, as that dorky freshman, Mr. Buxton spoke to me like he would to any adult. If he approved or disapproved of something I'd done, I knew it right away because he didn't put on that mask that some teachers have when they're talking to kids. If I asked him a question on Wednesday, he'd come back to me on Friday saying that he'd thought about it, and he really had. He made you, he made you feel like he wanted you on his team. And looking back on it, I think it was Mr. Buxton who made, oh, sorry, it was Mr. Buxton who made me want to be a teacher. So about 13 years ago, I started teaching history at Wings Academy, a public high school in the Bronx. Now, Wings Academy did not have the same resources as when I was in Mr. Buxton's classroom, where I was teaching, uh, my colleagues and I um, would talk about the, the resources that our students needed, the books we wanted them to read, a field trip we wanted to take them on, art supplies that we needed for an art project. We'd spent a lot of our own money on copy paper and, and pencils, but I could see firsthand that all schools are not created equal. And I just figured that there were people out there who'd wanna help teachers like us and students like ours if they could see where their money was going. If they could get involved peer to peer, to use Jeremy's phrasing. So using uh, pencil and paper, I, I drew out this website where public school teachers could create classroom project requests and donors could choose the project they wanted to support. For $2,000, this programmer uh, from Poland was willing to uh, build the site that I had drawn out. It was super rudimentary. The back end was one web page that you'd have to scroll down for like 15 minutes to get to the teacher or the project record that you were looking for. To process a donation, I had one of those black boxes that you see at the grocery store where the cashier will like punch in the credit card number and the dollar amount and send it over a telephone line. It was like PayPal, but by hand. And it was a really good thing that my students were helping me to get the site off the ground. So I had this new site created and then I, I had to get my colleagues to try out the site. Now if you wanna get teachers to do something, you give them free food. I don't know if people would uh, say the same dynamic applies at Columbia Business School. So I asked, um, asked my mom to make her roasted pear dessert. These are roasted pears with 
uh, orange rind and apricot glaze and spices. They taste something awesome. And I, I took my mom's dessert. She'd roasted 11 pears. And I, I put those pears on the uh, table in the teacher's lunchroom. And before my colleagues could scarf them down, I said, hold up. There's a toll. If you eat one of these pears, you got to go to this new website called donorschoose.org and ask her whatever it is you most want for your students. Propose the project that you've always wanted to do with them. Sounded like a pretty good deal and took only a couple minutes for uh, my colleagues to decimate the 11 pairs and then they proceeded to post the first 11 projects. Uh, the health teacher, she ate the dessert first uh, and she wanted to do a pregnancy prevention project for which she needed baby think it over dolls which are uh, life size, life weight dolls that cry at three in the morning and need to be fed and show a teenager what it would be like if they had a kid. Uh, the English teacher, he ate the dessert next. He wanted to prepare his students for the SAT, uh, so he requested test prep books. The art teacher, she wanted to do a wall-to-wall -wall quilt with each of her students sewing a square, so she requested fabric and thread and needles. My aunt, who's a nurse, she funded the first project, but I didn't know uh, any more donors to fund the other 10 projects. So I funded them myself, which I could afford to do because uh, I was still living at home with my parents and uh, they were not charging me any rent. I could spare some of my teacher's salary to do this. And because I donated anonymously, my colleagues mistakenly thought that the website actually worked and that, <laughs> and that there were all these donors just waiting on the site to fulfill teachers' classroom dreams. That rumor spread across the Bronx and teachers started posting hundreds of projects, projects which needed a whole lot more money than what I could afford uh, living at home with my parents. I was in a really tough spot, not knowing how I was going to get these projects funded. My students came to the rescue. They could see the potential of this experiment to change their lives at school. And I think they also felt bad for me. Uh, so for three months, they volunteered every day after school to spread word to potential donors. And we went old school, almost as old school as Jeremy's fax machine. My, my students addressed and compiled 2,000 letters by hand to people all over the country telling them about this website where somebody with $5 could be a classroom hero. We sorted the mail ourselves to get the, the cheapest postal rate, so every desk in my classroom represented a, a different region of the country. And then we carted the sorted letters to the post office and crossed our fingers. It worked. My students' letter writing campaign generated $30,000 in donations to classroom projects on our site. We were off. Another year went by, more teachers in the Bronx created projects, donors funded some of them. And then 9-11 happened. And teachers at the schools beside Ground Zero started posting projects for recovering from the attacks on the World Trade Center. It was a, a math teacher whose students' calculators were sealed at the disaster site. Their classroom had been relocated to a basement, and she was requesting a new set of calculators. It was a high school art teacher who wanted to bring in uh, an Afghan artist to do after school workshops so students could learn about Afghanistan. It was a first grade teacher just a, a few blocks from Ground Zero whose students had been saved by a particular group of firemen and her students wanted to thank the firemen who had saved them and uh, they wanted to do a musical performance in front of the fire ladder company. For that they needed musical instruments. There were hundreds of these projects related to 9-11 and I thought, I presumed, that local media would jump on this story. This was right when uh, uh, people yearned to participate in the 9-11 recovery effort. The Red Cross had almost too many blood donations than they could put to use, and, and here was this direct way for people to help. But no reporters would give me the time of day. I must have called a hundred of them, and none of them would talk with me. So I figured I, I better aim higher. Holy Grail was, of course, the New York Times, and uh, they had a new reporter covering nonprofits and philanthropy. Her name was Stephanie Strom. 
And I figured if we could get Stephanie Strom to do a story about our site, we would have a shot at big time impact. So I put together a package of materials and I mailed them off to Stephanie Strom at the Times. I didn't hear back. So a couple weeks later I called her up and uh, Stephanie was nice but uh, said that we were awfully small potatoes. Said if I'm ever doing a, a, a listing, a roundup of online charities, which at the time was still a, a pretty new concept, uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll slot you in but I'm afraid uh, you're, not, you're not newsworthy. Damn. So then I found a, a directory of the top uh, people at Newsweek, and I called up Jonathan Alter, the senior editor. I called him first because his last name began with A, and so he showed up first in the alphabetical directory. And uh, I called him during my lunch hour, and his assistant must have been out to lunch because he picked up the phone and said, hey, I'm a teacher up in the Bronx. I started this nonprofit with my students. Do you want to hear about it? And he said, sure. He didn't hang up on me. We talked for 45 minutes, and that night, he wrote a column for the Newsweek website saying that uh, this experiment growing out of a Bronx classroom might one day change philanthropy. So that got me all excited. I called up Stephanie Strom at the New York Times. And I was like, hey, Newsweek saw us as newsworthy, at least for their website. So won't you give us a, a second look? And then she dashed my hopes. She said, I wouldn't touch your story with a 10-foot pole now that another reporter has covered you. The New York Times does not follow in the footsteps of other publications. <laughs> I felt like an idiot for having told her that another media outlet had broken our story. Uh, so I wrote, a, I wrote her an email apologizing for being so dumb. And Stephanie could tell how badly I felt. She wrote back saying, you know, don't, don't feel so bad. Because you didn't have a chance in the first place. <laughs> because my editors have asked me to focus strictly on charities responding to 9-11. There was my last opening. I crafted this email to Stephanie Strom describing all of the 9-11 related projects that Teachers Beside Ground Zero were creating on our site. And I called her up over the weekend, I, uh, purposefully, so that I wouldn't interrupt her while she was on deadline, and said, hey, this is the last time you're going to hear from me, if you could just read this one final email. Monday I was back teaching, and I checked my email in between periods, and Stephanie Strom had written back. She wanted to come do a feature story for the New York Times and do a major interview. Let me tell you, I was, I was over the moon. My parents raised me to be humble, but it felt like the skies had opened and I, I just had to shout. So I, I forwarded Stephanie's email to my friend and I said, guess who said she wouldn't touch our story with a 10 foot pole and now wants an interview? That's what hustling will get you. I, I, I beat my chest, I talked all kinds of smack. I was just so psyched, I was just full of bravado. I, I thought I'd hit forward. I'd, I'd hit reply, <laughs> and the moment I realized, I yanked the electrical cord out of the wall socket. <laughs> but it was too late. I sent that trash-talking, chest-beating email to Stephanie Strom, philanthropy reporter for the New York Times. <laughs> Getting nervous adrenaline reliving this experience. Uh, <laughs> So naturally, I sent Stephanie another email apologizing for being so dumb. <laughs> and to Stephanie's eternal credit, she did not hold it uh, against me. She went on to write a major feature story for the Times suggesting that DonorsChoose.org might be the, the future of philanthropy. And we have tried uh, to prove her right. So uh, more than a million people, we call them citizen philanthropists, have given almost $200 million to classroom projects uh, created by teachers at nearly half of all the public schools in America. There are almost 10 million kids who've got books, art supplies, field trips, technology, uh, 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 pet hedgehogs, lumber for a theater production, 
through our site. And I, I sure as heck never thought uh, when I was teaching in the Bronx that I would one day be at the Columbia Business School Social Enterprise Conference sharing numbers like that. Thank you. So, so when, when people uh, see these numbers, they're often uh, surprised to learn that almost half of that $192 million for classroom projects came by way of corporate partnerships, by way of helping businesses do well by doing good. And then when they hear that a huge chunk of that $192 million came from corporate partnerships, they assume, oh, those must have just been big checks going into your bank account uh, as kind of like major gifts fundraising and never really did anything to, to boost uh, the peer-to-peer -peer involvement that Jeremy talked about. But in fact, corporate partnerships have fueled what we call citizen philanthropy. So right now, for example, uh, J. Crew is giving a special uh, match code to its employees, which will double a J. Crew employee's donation to a classroom project on donorschoose.org. And GGP, General Growth Properties, which owns a lot of malls, uh, has been sending donorschoose.org gift cards to their top customers so that those customers can choose classroom projects that they want to support on GGP's dime. If you go to our site, you'll see that um, any teacher at a rural public high school who has created an environmental science project has their project half funded by UPS. And these are all examples of companies who are um, empowering their customers to be active philanthropists. And, and we would distinguish that from the kind of classic cause marketing experience that, that customers have, which I, I would think of as the, the, kind of the just trust us cause marketing experience, where a, a, a customer or a consumer is invited to buy a, a, a t-shirt and they're told that X percent of their purchase is going toward a good cause and that cause may not be the cause dearest to the consumer's heart. And they're kind of left wondering whether that philanthropic commission really did go to the cause. They can't see their dollars at work. They're not invited to play any role. They're, they're asked to just sit back, remain passive, just trust us, something good happened when you bought a given item. And what DonorsChoose.org uh, allows is a far more active experience for the consumer. The consumer, instead of being passive, can be a, a, a true citizen philanthropist. They can uh, uh, choose the project they want to support on GGP's dime. They can activate a match on the project of their support thanks to UPS. And I'm going to um, just quickly explain how we've taken that to the next level, because we thought um, how uh, uh, sort of suboptimal it was that um, a company that really wanted to bring philanthropy inside their product still had to send a customer or a client off to donorschoose.org to see their match offer to spend the gift card that they were underwriting. So we created this uh, 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 API so that companies would be able to integrate microphilanthropy into their products. And uh, because of time, I'm just going to say this is uh, one of hundreds of web developers who have used our API to build their own version of donorschoose.org, their own apps using our, our, our content, uh, and as a result got a, a trophy from our board member, Stephen Colbert. And here are a couple examples of our API in action with corporate partnerships. If you go to any Starbucks right now and use their free Wi-Fi, the community tab on the portal that begins your free internet experience will show you classroom project requests that are a stone's throw from where you're sitting at that moment. And a Starbucks does that by drawing on our API and uh, serving up to the customer classroom projects that are most geographically proximate to that Starbucks store. Um, if you walk into a Sonic drive-in uh, and, and get any product, actually even if you just go to Sonic drive-in's website, whether or not you've made a purchase, you are given a code to vote on the classroom project that you want to see Sonic fund. And Sonic will then fund half a million dollars of the projects that get the most upvotes. And the crazy thing is that uh, during our first uh, season, of their campaign called Why Mids for Learning, more people had the DonorsChoose.org experience on Sonic Drive-In than on DonorsChoose.org directly. Final example is um, at Chevron, if you fill up uh, at a station, uh, 
you actually generate a full dollar to a nearby classroom project, and Chevron uses our API to show their customers the exact projects that were funded, so a customer can see the impact in their own backyard. I'm gonna end by um, integrating micro-philanthropy into your experience today at this conference. If you go into your goodie bag, and you gotta make sure you do this, you're gonna find a $25 donorschoose.org gift card for you to spend on the classroom project of your choice. And this is underwritten by our board of directors. Um, and I really hope you'll each redeem your gift card. If you don't redeem it, it means you hate children. <laughs> and, and when you redeem it, put our site to the test. Express a personal passion. That could be the town where you grew up, or the sport you played in high school, or the hobby that you're pursuing, or your favorite author, and see what classroom project requests match your passion, and see how anybody now can be a philanthropist. Thank you. portion of the day. Thank you so much, Charles, for being awesome. Uh, and Jeremy also for being awesome, which is, are they not awesome? They're awesome. <laughs> Everybody tweet that. Um, so the first thing, or clap. Um, the first thing, because we don't have a whole lot of time, the first thing that I wanted to ask you both is when you're in front of a room like this, a full auditorium early in the morning, and, uh, and everybody's engaged and pumped up, what is your call to action, each of you? What do you want them to actually do? D like, tell them, instruct them. I'll spend your gift card and check out Rachel Sklar's birthdays on donorschoose.org because it will be such inspiration and a, a model for people to follow of how somebody can use our site to rally their friends around projects that match their own values. We didn't plan that, but <laughs> awesome. Um, Jeremy. I would say, you know, think about going out and becoming a movement entrepreneur or better still, go work for um, you know, a movement entrepreneur. That could be working for Purpose, or it could be working for any number of other organizations. I think one of the things now that's um, great is everybody wants to go out and be an entrepreneur, but actually we also need great people to go and work for rapidly growing early stage ventures and not just all want to be entrepreneurs themselves. So figure out which of the two you're in, um, but, um, but we need, we need you. Don't go to Goldman Sachs. Okay, Sorry, well. they're a sponsor, but uh, don't go to that other. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, my next question, you just made my next question a two-parter. <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, it's, uh, obviously it's, we're all following the government shutdown and uh, particularly there's a lot of stories of uh, government workers, especially with yesterday's crisis at the Capitol, government workers who despite not technically being paid, nonetheless went into the breach. And I think when you're talking about social enterprise, especially when you're building them at the beginning, there is, there's an implicit and often an explicit need for the people who join you to build your organization to take a, a pay cut and to, you know, they, they bear the brunt of building this organization. So uh, the first part of that, and then we'll get to Goldman, uh, is, is how do you incentivize great people to build this organization with you and keep them there? So Jeremy first. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's definitely a challenge. So we operate in this middle space between the for-profit sector and the non-profit sector. We're a B Corp. We can't afford to pay sort of top corporate salaries. We try to pay better than like um, uh, an NGO salary if we can. So ultimately what you've got to do is give people like really powerful opportunities to step up and to learn. And I think that the space that we occupy, these, these new crowd-based ventures, they're just enormously interesting in terms of learning for people. So it's learning, it's staying anchored to purpose, um, and you know, actually uh, having a very clear and well-defined set of values. Uh, Charles? Uh, gosh, well, we, we try and um, recruit people who have a, a real a kind of a business acumen and who want to join a, 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 a cause-based organization that will value their business acumen. Um, so I'm especially glad to be 
uh, speaking here, and, and I hope everybody will go to donorschoose.org slash jobs to see how awesome it is working in our organization. Um, and, and one reason why I, I, I'd like to think it is kind of awesome is that it's in our DNA to, to push intelligence out to the edge. It, it's, in, it, it's the very model of our organization that um, I wouldn't, my colleagues and I wouldn't know best what to do out on the front lines. Our, our, our reason for being is that teachers in the classroom know best what micro solutions will make the biggest difference for their students. And I'd like to think that that permeates our own workplace culture in that we, we, we push intelligence out to um, colleagues at, at every level and, and I think have come up with some uh, awesome uh, innovations as a result. So that's the unforeseen second part of the question because you raised uh, the golden question. So uh, whether or not, no matter how inspired this audience is, and, and probably a goodly number of people here are the people you know, um, entering the workforce with and with a fantastic degree from a wonderful institution such as Columbia, uh, will choose to go to a big corporation that can help them pay their bills and their rent and whatever they may owe after attending a wonderful institution like <laughs> Columbia. Uh, so how do you, and by the way, that's also me. I used to be a corporate lawyer. I came to New York as a, 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 after law school as a lawyer and then quit to be a writer and then activist because that's where the money is. <laughs> um, so how do you, for those people, how do you engage them in your organization? And how do you get them to engage their organization to then do your will? <laughs> I mean, Goldman's a sponsor, right? So That's right. there must be something in it. Well, look, I have a couple of things. Firstly, in terms of the people we look for, you know, we love hybrid -y people. So I think it's actually really helpful in your careers to go out and spend time in the private sector, you know, I started my career at McKinsey, like go out and do those things. That, I mean, you know, I was being kind of a little, uh, uh, you know, a little flip because really um, having the sort of multi-sectoral experience, I think most of the most high impact work in the world, like what Donors Choose is doing, sort of sits at those intersections. They need to be effective at mobilizing corporates in order for their business model to work, but they also need to have a really strong social change DNA and be really rooted in the, in the, in the policy and all the changes they want to make. So I think go out and get those different experiences. In terms of how you operate within an organization like, like Goldman, um, you know, I, th I think you have to try to find the pockets of innovation. And, you know, uh, large institutions by design kind of cripple some of the kind of innovation or entrepreneurialism that you might have uh, and want to exercise. But there are ways to carve out innovation even within those organizations. But I would start by thinking about the design of what you're doing, um, because otherwise structure will, will kill agency. I think Jeremy said it best. Uh, I got little to add to that. Other than that, we, we um, recruit most heavily from uh, classroom teachers, especially those who've used donorschoose.org, and we recruit heavily from people with a straight business background, and um, just w one example of uh, what Jeremy was describing. And so how do you make the business case for what you're doing when you're trying to engage either uh, sort of uh, like celebrities like Oprah or, or Stephen Colbert or corporations that you want to work with? How do you, you know, as, a, as someone who also has worked in the sector and my movement is uh, movement is change the ratio hashtag change the ratio as JT and Jimmy Fallon would say um, uh, and the list and you know it's uh, the the way I practically speaking in terms of it's a diversity organization it's an increase in visibility access and opportunity for women and I have learned very quickly that I have to make a business case for that rather than a it's golly gee it's a good thing case for that. So, uh, so how do you make that business case that this is a, a worthwhile endeavor for your partners to engage in? Well, so I'll just quickly, lest anyone have any doubts, if you haven't read the, the huge profile of Rachel in the Times, if, if anybody has any doubts about her uh, prowess as a maven, you should know that um, the Warby Parker partnership that, that we launched a, a few months ago with Mindy Kaling as our uh, spokeswoman was thanks to Rachel. Uh, and in any case, when we are working with uh, celebrities like Mindy Kaling, I'll, I'll give you the example of how Stephen Colbert first got engaged with DonorsChoose.org. He was um, uh, planning a, a s sort of semi-satirical run for the presidency. He, he, he entered the South Carolina uh, Democratic primary. And he had all these viewers who kind of wanted to give money toward that campaign. They, they wanted nothing more than to show their support in a material, financial way. 
But I don't think Stephen Colbert felt responsible taking real hard money for a campaign that you know, probably wouldn't ultimately uh, put him in the White House. And it was at that moment that we uh, managed to uh, uh, sort of get word to Stephen about uh, the ability he had to create a philanthropic presidential straw poll on donorschoose.org, where there was a, a page dedicated to each candidate, and on each of these pages were, were classroom projects related to that candidate's background. And if you donated to a classroom project on a candidate's page, it would push that candidate higher up in what he would ultimately call a straw poll that makes a difference. And it was because we were able to um, give him an idea that met almost one of his, not, not a business need, but, but it met a, a, a very real need he had at the time that uh, I, I think is, is why he's, he's now on our board of directors. And if we had simply gone to him saying, here's this cause, it, doesn't it resonate with your heart? And isn't it inspiring? It, we, we probably would not have uh, engaged with him as, as we did. And, and of course, when we're talking to companies, we, we try and make the exact same uh, case. And whether that's by showing uh, a case study of a Crate and Barrel seeing an actual increase in sales after they distributed DonorsChoose.org gift cards to their top customers, or whether that's quantifying the number of Facebook shares that will uh, reference a company where the number of times someone will say, I just teamed up with UPS to support this rural environmental science project on, uh, uh, on Facebook and, and um, enable uh, a grant to DonorsChoose.org to be framed as a, a Facebook advertising play. It's, it's kind of all the same uh, theme. Mm, totally, and I think the good news is that these crowd-based models actually do scale better and they are more efficient, right? So it's, if you're an NGO and you've got to get those people who kind of hang out on the streets annoying people trying to sign them up for donations, that's a really expensive model that has like small margins. If you can raise that money online by coming up, by developing a real community, that's much, much cheaper because the infrastructure to run that tends to be much more efficient. And so many of the movements we've started are funded by crowdfunding, often at really extraordinary levels. And when you get the movement building right, you actually have to spend almost no time on the fundraising, relatively speaking. So the models themselves, when you do invest in building a crowd, not a fake one, um, they, they're scalable, they're efficient, and so you can make the argument that the return on investment is great. So when we go to philanthropists, we can say, hey, we're not gonna need you in five years if you fund us for this, for this initial ramp up. And that tends to be something that they, they quite like. And, uh, and okay, so after the, after the five years, when you're, when you're, you know, you're, at, you're humming along nicely and you're a success and you're on all the lists, uh, what, what are the challenges then? Like what are the challenges of both of your organizations now in 2013? Whatever the, you know, whatever, whatever situations, like whether it be sort of transition to mobile or, you know, whatever it may be, what we are, what's the biggest challenge right now that keeps you up at night? Well, our board chair tells us always never to read our own press. So we, we don't uh, spend any time patting ourselves on the backs uh, uh, as to what lists we're, we're on. In fact, we really spend our time anxious and hungry thinking about how we're going to achieve uh, uh, growth in the, in the following year. And, and a couple years ago, it actually looked like our growth was going to taper off. Uh, we posted 17% year-over-year growth in new donors, which for us was kind of tepid growth. And I, uh, we didn't know it at the time, but our challenge was that our teachers uh, were not acting like project creators on Kickstarter. Our teachers were coming to our site, spending a lot of effort and energy creating a great project, but then saying, I've never asked for money before. Uh, I'm kind of uneasy about that. Uh, I'll let DonorsChoose.org shoulder responsibility for driving donations to my project. And, and, and we ourselves thought of it as 100% our responsibility to generate uh, donations for, for teachers' projects. And we, we started seeing that when we gave teachers uh, tools to share their projects with their former classmates who now working at, at Goldman, um, uh, to share their projects with their friends and family, uh, actually teachers did have the potential to rally their networks uh, uh, like Kickstarter project creators do for theirs. And um, we ultimately found out that what we really needed to do was to give teachers a, a promo code that will double anybody's donation to their project. And then they, are, th they get over their, their sort of immediate apprehension about fundraising. And it's given our organization a, a huge second wind.
Yeah, I mean, I, I think we spend a lot of time thinking about like how do you stay at the edge of innovation. So right now, a lot of the stuff you get, you know, you, you get too many emails asking you to do stuff and sign petitions, and there's a real fatigue on that. So the question is, what are the new ways to engage people that maintain that authenticity? I mean, when Obama in 2012 started sending you emails with like subject lines like dinner, question mark, <laughs> you know, you knew that that wasn't for reals. Wait, you got um, that too? Uh, yeah, exactly. I would always respond and go, hey, B, super busy, you know, see you soon. Um, but, uh, but, but I mean, this is the thing, right? That that um, you know. So in other words, we have to keep finding ways to not kind of commoditize the work that we do that might have been innovative four or five years ago. And for us as well as an organization, as we hit you know 80, 90, 100 people, is like how does culture and 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 that capacity to be lean and nimble scale with that increased size? Because it's very different to when we were like you know 10 people. Uh, I'm going to open it up for questions, but before, but before I do it, my, my last question is going to be, so it, this is your field, so you're obviously aware of who is coming up in it, and just to pay it forward, uh, are, is there any organization like yours or that, that you just, something that's new and starting and you're like, that is on fire, I can't wait to see that explode, um, and I'll give you a second to think about it, because we didn't plan any of these questions beforehand, uh, I will tell you mine, mine is She's the First, a wonderful organization that uh, sends girls in developing uh, countries to school so that they can be the first in their families to graduate. And I am on the board of She's the First, so it's a little plug, but I generally did think of this just sitting up here. Um, gentlemen. I love uh, this startup um, run by a couple of friends of mine called Mosaic, which is, uh, which is basically a crowd investment for solar projects. So it's trying to turn funding for clean energy into something far more visual, far more compelling. And it's about funding kind of iconic solar projects um, that are community scale, so you know, on top of school roofs, things like that, because we really need um, to kind of shift the way people think about clean energy, um, lest we all go to hell in a handbasket. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm thinking just of um, sites in the, the crowdfunding space, which has, is really blossoming, thanks in, the, you know, in great part to the success of Kickstarter, where my wife works and, and we share a board member with Kickstarter, so they would be one, of course. But um, I think of a WOTC, uh, which is a crowdfunding site where people can support individual medical needs, and it's 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 uh, beautifully done, uh, and uh, I'm I'm rooting for them. Those are great. All right, everybody, tweet that. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, just if you have ooh, oh. a little loud. If you have a question, we have Mike on both sides. We, we're running a bit over. We're going to end at 9.25, so just a couple of questions. Oh. But raise your hand, stay in your seat, and one of us will bring you a mic. So you can get there. As quickly as I can get over there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Do you all get a car? <laughs> Hi, my name is Renika Agarwal. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us. Um, my question is related to team building. So if you are an individual with an idea, um, I guess my question is twofold. One is, was finding a team, your initial team for you, sort of an organic, natural process that just happened? Or did you go out and actively solicit people to come on board? And B, at what stage is it appropriate to really start seriously thinking about taking it beyond a one-man sort of initiative and, and really bringing other people on board? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, the early people you hire um, or bring on are critical and, you know, be obsessive about recruiting and have a really rigorous process. And I think about how much I've learned, like how much better I am at that now than I was four, or four years ago when we were starting this. And yet we still stumbled on amazing early people. But like, I think having a culture where you're obsessive about that is only a good thing. Um, and the other thing is like, yeah, at some point as an entrepreneur, you have to take the plunge. Like the big difference between doing it like in your 20% time and part time, and then when you when you commit to it and take the risk of doing it, and you know we all have stories like the wonderful story that Charles tell, the you know the sort of that early hustling is is the is the great joy and the great key to entrepreneurship, and tenacity is everything. But actually, one of the key parts of that is going, you know what, I'm going to take the risk and I'm going to go at it. Now, not everybody can afford to do that, right? So. Um, so unfortunately, sometimes entrepreneurship favors those who can, right? But, but the ability to, you know, put yourself into it 150%, that's the step change in my experience uh, that really gets your, your idea going. Right, this will be the last one. We have so little time, but one person back here. 
Hi, good morning. My question is for Mr. Best, and I was wondering, what sort of mechanisms do you have in place to guarantee that the funds you receive go to the projects that they're intended to go to? I'm, I'm so glad you asked, and definitely Charles. I was only Mr. Best <laughs> to my students. Uh, uh, so uh, there are three things we do. Uh, the first is that we vet and validate each classroom project request before it's posted to the public site. Then when the project is funded, we don't pass through cash to the teacher. We fulfill the project. We purchase the resources. So even if the project is therapeutic horseback riding for disabled students, we're paying horseback riding stable to provide that service. And then the teacher compiles photographs and thank you letters uh, for the project brought to life. And I'll give you just one example of how we make all that scalable, because people hear that and they're like, that sounds really labor intensive. And at the time that we launched, eBay was all the rage, and people thought that Amazon's model was uh, uh, sort of not the way of the future. And so that when we began, people really questioned the fact that we were trying to um, guarantee the integrity and the quality of the donor-teacher exchange. The way we've made vetting and validating scalable is actually to um, turn to our best teacher users, our so-called beneficiaries, and we ask them to volunteer their time to vet other teachers' project requests, which they do in droves, and actually when we switched from paying people to vet and validate each project to asking our best users and beneficiaries to volunteer their time, when we went from paying people to crowdsourcing the labor, not only did we eliminate a huge cost center, but productivity shot through the roof. When we paid people, it took us 10 days to vet and validate a project, and now it takes us one and a half calendar days. So even inclusive of the weekend, one and a half days to do that vetting quality uh, control uh, by asking our so-called beneficiaries to be our coworkers. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, we're all on Twitter, and you can just uh, tweet those questions at us. I want to thank Charles, Mr. Best, uh, and, and Jeremy, Mr. Hymans, uh, for talking with us Life. today. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, uh, use your Donors Choose gift, gift card, go forth and build a movement, and, uh, and then make Goldman Sachs pay for it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, guys.